reporting. We all know that the mining industry is, for the most part, you know, following um, regulations and recording certain information. Mining companies have to be as they need to retain permits and to um, re retain their license to operate, basically. <laughs> but how well is it faring in ESG reporting? And that is the question we are exploring today in this panel on ESG reporting. And I'd just like to introduce um, our panel. Um, at the far right, uh, left, we have um, Nancy Norris, who is the Senior Director of ESG and Digital Trust uh, for the Ministry for Ma Energy Mines and Low Carbon Innovation for the Government of British Columbia in Canada. That's a very long title, it's a Nancy. Very long title. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, next to her, we have Anna Brog, who is the Head of Sustainability at Kenmar resources, uh, which is one of the world's leading uh, mineral sands producers, and I think you've got an operation in, in Mozambique. Um, we then have Ben Chalmers, who is the senior vice president uh, mine, uh, for the Mining Association of Canada, who is, ha has been going since 1935, which is well done on that. Um, we have Daniel Chigamira who is a consultant and a very um, experienced um, cell side mining research analyst, very experienced in ESG data. And finally, we have Alice England, who is general counsel for Ecora Resources. And for those who don't know, um, Ecora Resources is a London listed royalty streaming company with 19 assets across Australia, North America and South America. Yeah. So, we will start with Ben. Um, please, can you set the scene for us? How would you describe the current state of ESG reporting in the mining sector and are companies getting right for the most part? Yeah, thanks uh, for the question. It, it, I guess in setting the stage, I would say the best way to characterize it is it's a crowded stage. Uh, when we started, uh, and and w when we as the Mining Association of Canada entered this space in 2004, we were the only uh, game in town. We were the only kids on the block in terms of sort of requiring mine site level reporting with multi-stakeholder oversight and, and external assurance. And today, it's a, it's a crowded landscape. There have been, uh, there's been a proliferation of standards since about 2015 or so into this space doing the same kind of reporting. And, and so one of the, the challenges that we face is, is how do we get it right? How do we help those companies that are either doing it right or not uh, get it right? Um, and I would say to that part of the question, um, it, you know, most are, uh, but you don't get it right all the time. I mean, there are still issues that mm -hmm. pop up and, and ESG reporting is, is certainly not a silver bullet. We certainly think it, it helps. Um, one of the things that we have been very conscious of lately is the, is the distinction between sort of performance reporting, you know, reporting like the kind that we do with towards sustainable mining um, that is aimed at helping companies build effective systems for managing their relationships, their environmental impacts and so on, uh, and combining those with, with, uh, with reporting standards, the kind of, of uh, uh, standards sort of that investors are asking for or customers are asking for with the data that they need to make decisions. And, and the two aren't necessarily the same and the two need to figure out how to work together. So, I mean, one of the other parts of, I think, the, the scene today is that I, I would suggest I think that we're, we're at peak standard or maybe even a little bit past it in terms of the proliferation. And there's more and more work going on now to, to help simplify that space. So we have, a few years ago, we developed a tool called uh, the Responsible Sourcing Alignment Supplement, which is a supplement to our Towards Sustainable Mining standard that has enabled companies like Tech Resources uh, for example, or Eldorado Gold, another uh, a company that's here today, I think I saw Jen Prospero in the audience, uh, do integrated audit uh, or integrated reporting with a number of standards, including the ICMM's mineral uh, or mining principles, the World Gold Council's responsible gold mining principles, and the Copper Mark responsible steel, and a few others. So with this tool, companies can do one audit and one report, and we funnel the information out to the other standards mm. to help them simplify things. Uh, we're doing things like um, uh, 
collaborating with other standards on the training of assurance providers. So we're running a, an accreditation workshop with the Coppermark in January to accredit uh, assurance providers to do both seamlessly. And then we also actually today, uh, what time is it? At one o'clock, we just released a press release uh, in partnership with the World Gold Council, ICMM, and the Coppermark around a project that some of you may have heard of around converging our four standards into one effort. Um, it's going to take time, and there's no certainty that we will actually manage to pull it off, but our hope is that we can sort of combine the best of the four standards into something uh, that'll be practically implementable uh, and effective and help reduce that, that landscape further. Mm -hmm. um, can I just ask, Ben, how is that going to align with the new ISSB standards? Well, I think it comes back to that distinction I made earlier about the difference between performance standards and reporting standards. So uh, a lot of the content for this convergence effort is coming from TSM, and one of the things that we're very conscious of is we focus on what makes a good man uh, management system, um, and then we require uh, reporting, public disclosure on certain things, but, it, um, but we, aren't, we don't specify. So it allows companies to use, say, the work that IFRS is doing, or GRI, mm -hmm. or any, so it allows some flexibility there in terms of how the reporting aspect is done to complement what is being done on the performance end. Thanks, Ben. And moving on to Anna, um, ESG reporting can be a, a difficult process fraught with many challenges. Um, I don't know, can Ma do a very good sustainability report? Um, what are some of the most difficult challenges you faced um, in your reporting journey with Kenmar? Thanks, Jade. Um, and just before I get to that, maybe just to comment on what Ben said, definitely welcome peak reporting requirements. <laughs> I'm not sure I feel that we're quite in that position yet with um, the EU regulations, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and new regulations on biodiversity <coughs> in the country where we operate in Mozambique coming in uh, into effect. So I, I'm looking forward to that day. I'm sure many um, heads of sustainability and people involved in reporting will welcome it. But in terms of the challenges, so um, being a mining company um, and, and looking into CSRD next year in particular, there aren't many issues that aren't material to us. So trying to uh, maintain focus and keep more on management um, agenda and radar and making progress against those is, is a real challenge. And obviously the output in terms of reporting is only as good as, as the input and strong governance, um, strong leadership, capability, capacity at site, and um, the resources supported by tools and assurance are, are all absolutely critical to that, to that good output. But in terms of maintaining the focus on um, you know, the, the broad spectrum of sustainability issues that you need to make progress on, um, we found a, a scorecard, a, a, a detailed scorecard that management review quarterly and um, it goes to the board as well, is really helpful to, to maintain that sort of pressure and focus. Obviously, um, the trend has been in recent years and Kemmer's followed that for executive remuneration to be simplified and to be focused on um, you know, four more strategic KPIs, but we've kept that detailed scorecard and that feeds into um, site-based um, discretionary pay as well. So I'd say, um, <coughs> making sure that you know that, we, that we're keeping uh, the, the focus on all of those very wide-ranging sustainability programs um, is, is something that's helped us feed through to a, um, a strong report. Another challenge I'd say is um, managing the sustainability risks and impacts through the supply chain and through the value chain, and obviously that's becoming you know more prominent with not just um, net zero commitments requiring. Um, targets to be set across scope three emissions, but also the likes of task force on nature related financial disclosures, accounting for biodiversity impacts through the value chain. And that, that's particularly challenging when you ha you're in a jurisdiction that has stringent regulations like the EU, but your customers or your suppliers aren't in a similar context. So Kemmer sells um, almost 50% of its products to China, um, working with our Chinese customers to get emissions data, um, processing of sold goods being you know, the lion's share of our scope three emissions um, is a journey that we're starting and we're looking forward to collaborating and, and partnering with our customers and hopefully getting um, 
good data from them and working on decarbonisation plans. But I, I, I can foresee it will be a challenge, and I think it's you know we would be naive to say that it's not going to be a, a long journey ahead of us. It's a wonder you get any sleep, Anna. <laughs> Um, Alice, moving to, to you, please. Uh, what specific disclosures and ESG reporting do investors specifically, um, such as royalty companies like, your, like yourself, uh, require to be disclosed by mining companies? Um, thank you. So just building on what Ben said, it mm. is a crowded market in terms of mm. ESG disclosures and also um, looking at investors, it's even crowded in the sense that investors want different disclosures. Each different type of investor wants a different type of disclosure. And so um, being in the mining company, there's a whole plethora of disclosures that um, they have to comply with and obviously can detract from the actual day job of actually running the mine as well. So from a royalty and streaming perspective, we don't actually, we don't have specific um, ESG disclosures that we require. Um, but also from a royalty and streaming perspective, you know, we're not equity, we're not debt, we're not in for short term and there's no sort of liquidity event generally after you've made the investment. Um, the initial investment we make is the key point of due diligence for a royalty and streaming company and then you're in for the life of the mine, you're a partner. Um, and so from an investment point of view, there's always been a sustainability angle in terms of royalties and streams because in its very nature, you have to have a sustainable investment for it to work the life of the mine. So the important thing from a royalty and stream perspective is that the reporting um, disclosures from the outset are there and so that you can due diligence the project and make the investments. Whether you report against the equator for principles, the IFC, TCFD, it's not one for us to necessarily dictate, but just to make sure that what you do report is measurable so that every year you can measure improvement so that it's not just a report of things that you're doing or a lot of words that you actually have key metrics, targets, KPIs, and that we can look and see improvement on that. Um, I also think, as Ben said, reporting alone isn't a silver bullet. And from a royalty and streaming perspective as well, we also look at reporting, but also generally royalty and streams have site visit rights actually coming up to the ground, speaking to people, mm. and then being able to actually compare what you're saying in your report that you're saying that you have done and then seeing mm. it on site and that it's actually been done. It's really important. So good reporting going on ha in hand with site visits is very helpful. Um, and also we, I think with the reporting piece, it's about having an ongoing dialogue as well. So. Yes, annual reports, sustainability reports are incredibly useful um, and they are helpful to make investments, but also having that dialogue on a year on year basis and an ongoing basis that we can understand what's happening at the mine, understanding what the improvements are and um, being able to measure it is just incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a collaborative relationship really between operator and loyalty and streaming investor. How important is third-party insurance, assurance, sorry. And I'll, I'll pass the question to Anna as well. I think third-party assurance, of course, helps mm -hmm. because it validates what they're saying and it supports that. And I think we do, we, as a water streaming company, we may get that third-party assurance ourselves and use some companies to do that due diligence, but having that done is extremely helpful because it obviously supports what they're saying. So I think any reporting mm. that is then assured is, is extremely helpful for many investor. Mm. Again, it's, you have to, you want to make sure that what you're asking for is a balance. And I think it is about a balance. You don't want to overburden some, a junior mining company to have assured reporting so that they might get an investment from us because they might not get an investment from us and that might not be because it's not third party assured. Mm -hmm. There's a whole, plethora of due diligence that we do as a company. So it's about doing reporting and measuring that is um, appropriate and adds value for your business. And I think the, the key thing I would say about reporting is that less can be more, as long as it's, you know, um, sort of quality, not quantity in that sense, um, that you're actually adding value, that reporting is adding value to what you're saying to your business. 
Anna, do you want to comment? Um, so CSRD will require all um, disclosures to be audited. I think, you know, when you look at that integration with financial data and for it to have the credibility and trust and the fact that, you know, finance teams and financial accounting standards are way more mature, obviously, we're relatively speaking, despite the plethora of frameworks and um, uh, regulations out there, sustainability is still on that maturity curve, so I think it will help with trust and credibility. Thanks, Anna. Um, Nancy, moving on to you. How can collaboration and knowledge sharing among mining industry stakeholders contribute to better ESG reporting standards? I know you're working on quite an interesting project at the moment. Yeah, so we found um, the work that I've been doing through the government of British Columbia We've been working collaboratively with mines um, and industry associations like the Mining Association of Canada, uh, investors, uh, the whole community around ESG and sustainability reporting to better understand what kind of data uh, mines have to collect and share about their sustainability performance and how that can be leveraged in a way that so it's more efficient for them to share information with their investment community, uh, with government uh, when they have to do regulatory submissions, um, and then also for purchasers, downstream purchasers, um, for supply chain traceability. Um, we uh, see that there is emerging and legislation in large consuming economies, um, such as the United States and the EU, around supply chain traceability and su uh, sustainability of supply chain actors. Um, so there's the Forced Labor Protection Act in the United States, um, there's the EU du Due Diligence Directive and uh, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. These are all um, pieces of legislation that are going to drive uh, behavior backwards along the supply chain. Um, and in particular, f as an exporting um, economy, which BC is, um, a, of natural resources, we think that um, if mines are uh, operators are prepared um, to share that information that they will have um, a better chance of um, competing in global markets that prioritize sustainability. So what we've done is working with mines, um, we've tried to identify exactly what pieces of data they need to share with different audiences and um, worked with them to better understand um, how emerging technology can assist with this. So we have a project called the Energy and Mines Digital Trust. Uh, we've been working collaboratively with the Mining Association of Canada for a year now on it. Um, and the two um, sort of key credentials that we've been designing, the first is a Mines Act permit that's issued by the BC government. So we have strong legislation around biodiversity protection, uh, carbon pricing, uh, relationships with First Nations, relationships with communities, on and on. So um, the, now we are actually in a position to um, issue a, a credential to a mine that allows them to show that they're permitted in the province. Um, so that actually uh, allows them to show provenance of their data, or sorry, of, of their products that they are exporting, and also um, it shows the legal framework that they have to operate in. And the second credential that we've been working on um, and are just about to go live with is the Towards Sustainable Mining um, Protocol. So th this is a sustainability report that mines um, who are members of the Mining Association of Canada have to submit on an annual basis. So what we've done is we've set up a uh, certifier, an auditing company, to be able to issue that credential to mines and um, then the mines are able to share that information with uh, the Mining Association of Canada to fulfill their membership obligations. Um, so together, these two credentials allow the mines in BC to prove out where their products are coming from and how they're produced. Um, and we, now that we have these two uh, credentials in place, we're working um, quite closely with other governments and uh, industry actors in order to allow them or enable them to uh, consume this information. Um, the US Customs and Border Protection Agency is testing this technology uh, for importing goods. Um, and we're also working closely with the EU who are developing a digital product passport using the same sort of technology. 
Um, so I think that, uh, in, to sum it up, in terms of collaboration, um, I think that there's an opportunity when governments and businesses and um, uh, industry associations work together to try and find the most efficient way to undertake ESG reporting and data sharing. Um, that uh, th a lot of opportunities arise for um, promoting and incenting a sustainable economy. It seems Canada is leading the pack in terms of uh, this kind of collaboration. Um, Danielle, we'll come to you. If we are to move towards better ESG reporting, it would be helpful for, for mining companies, um, particularly the preparers of the, the reports, to understand how the ESG data is, is used, particularly by analysts such as yourself. Um, can you give us some insight? Sure, so there are four principal ways that, that have used ES, the ESG data that the mining companies produced and starting from like the more granular and getting more esoteric. So the first way is around um, looking at comparisons, creating frameworks and looking at ESG scoring, right? And we've obviously seen a proliferation of ESG scores over the past four or five years. Um, in my work as a sell side analyst covering the sector, I've created a um, sector-specific mining ESG framework and just trying to address some of the gaps that some of the third-party scorers have. So looking forward-looking, not just backward-looking, looking at some of the positives, the ESG positives in the sector, not just the ESG negatives. And obviously building this out from a perspective of someone who understands the sector, at least from, from the outside. And so even though there are criticisms that um, scores, ESG scores or ESG ratings are myopic, that they can sometimes encourage behavior that isn't the best from a macro perspective. That is basically the status quo, and so that's an important use of the ESG data um, as it currently stands. The second is around um, looking at companies and trying to pass out areas of idiosyncratic, like upside or downside. Um, and so as a result of you know, looking at this um, specific framework that are built, um, even though there are issues that are similar across all of the companies in the sector, there are, depending on where the company is and what the particular issues are, there are sometimes areas of idiosyncratic risk. Um, and doing that work, getting into the weeds in the ESG data kind of helps one to extract that. So one particular example, um, water use disclosure has improved significantly over the past three years. And so if I have a company that gives water extraction by mine, I can combine that with grade projections, production, and also capital intensity to figure out, well, if this company is a Chilean copper miner extracting water from the Atacama Desert, and they would have to switch completely to desalination, for example, what is the cap on the total capex that they would have to spend in order to do that? Right? And so that's separate from an ESG score for the company, but it is very financially relevant in terms of this company might have to double capex over the next three years or something like that, a conclusion like that. The third way of using the data is to see if the ESG data is consistent with the way the company talks about their strategy. Right? So if we're seeing, for example, a deterioration in safety, is fixing that, does it have primacy in terms of the way the company articulates their strategy? If not, that's a concern. Um, another is thinking about some, some forward-looking um, emissions reductions targets. Right? So for example, I covered a diversified mining company who produces met coal, and so they have fugitive emissions. And they gave, like year by year, graphically, the methane emissions that they expected to produce. And so they had a period where they had completely flat methane emissions, but production growing 20, 30%. Right, so I'm not a geologist, I'm, I'm not a mechanical engineer. However, from the outside, that seems counterintuitive, right? And that um, difference in and of itself isn't concerning, but what was concerning is a company's inability to articulate how they could keep methane emissions flat and grow their met coal production 30%. Right? And so um, digging into the data and comparing it with the normal day-to-day -day, um, work of being an analyst can, can highlight some of those inconsistencies. 
And in some instances, they can suggest that maybe there isn't, um, the sustainability targets aren't necessarily fully integrated in the overall company strategy. And the last and, and the most esoteric is keeping this data in perspective, right? So let's not mistake data for action. Um, one of the things that's obvious looking at this data is that it's kind of barbelled in terms of its focus. So you have this top, these top-down metrics, top-down environmental impact, how management might be incentivized based on that, how Exco specifically is incentivized based on that. And then increasingly you have like asset by asset environmental impact as well. Well, in a lot of corporations, especially bigger ones, meaningful change happens at the middle. Right, so are mine managers or divisional managers also being incentivized on improving that sustainability data? Um, and I would argue that's the, the level of change that we need to see in order to see meaningful improvement in the sustainability footprint for the sector. Thanks, Daniel. Um, really interesting. And I'll, I'll lead into a, a group discussion now, uh, a group question here. What makes for a best practice ESG report? And I know, Alice, you said it's um, quality over quantity. But perhaps um, we could get some more insight for preparers in the room. I'm happy to jump in. So oh, I, not to disagree with one of my panelists, but as a, as a typical analyst, more, more is always useful, mm -hmm. right? So I have definitely seen, even just over the past two, three years, and partly in a small part because of some of the um, more contentious conversations I've had with the companies that I've covered, that they've released additional data that speaks to specific issues, right? So, and putting separate, putting the like reporting standards issue aside, um, I think that it's inevitable that the data types will evolve given the conversations that companies are having with investors, with analysts continue to evolve. Um, and so it probably doesn't help those preparing the reports, but I think, I think more is always better. Um, and I, th I think what I touched on last is um, giving some insight in terms of how people within the business, within the, within the core of the business, are incentivized on sustainability metrics, if they are. Fair enough, the CEO has a safety standard, but, and we know that safety standards happen at mine level as well, but what about emissions intensity? What about water use? Are mine managers, divisional managers, being incentivized on that? And if they are, that, that would be great information to have. So just having a bit more information about how that sustainability strategy runs through the company, rather than how it's just imposed from the top down. That's something I'd love to see in an ESG report and have not seen that yet. Mm. I'll take a stab. Um, look, I think the key is understanding what constitutes decision-ready information and, and understanding the audiences too. I mean, Danielle talked about the importance of the mine managers. Uh, and, and understanding the data that they need to make the decisions around ESG at the mine site. That's where our work focuses. So the TSM metrics are all about um, those discrete things that make up a good water management system, a good tailings monitoring system, and so on. We have an annual dialogue that we host with um, investors, institutional investors in Canada. Um, and, and this year's was, uh, was on biodiversity as a theme, but we got into a really interesting discussion around decision-ready information. And we were describing what we do with TSM and our members that were in the room were talking about how they use it. And the, the investors said, but we want the raw data. Like, it's fine to have the scorecard, but we want the raw data. And, and, and the mining company representatives in the room said, are, are you sure? Are you sure you want the raw data? Do you really want to know how many caribou sightings we had in a week or what the copper concentration in the daily water sample was? That's our raw data. And the investors said, no, no, that's not what we want. Uh, and so understanding what that decision-ready information that mm. powers the mind to go ahead with good ESG practices, and then what do the investors need, and then increasingly what do our customers need, because that's not always aligned either, the questions aren't the same, and what do our communities need to understand that we're acting responsibly. And that's the challenge. I think in part that's why we've seen this proliferation of standards and, and other tools, and now we need to do better at asking those questions. And, and delivering that information in, in ways that, that can be consumed by each of the appropriate audiences. Absolutely, Ben. Yeah, Atlas? I'm just building that. Yeah, and I wanted to, to add to mine. I mean, I'm certainly 
not saying to report less is the way forward. I think talking how ESG reporting has evolved over the past few years, we used to have very large sustainability reports coming through from companies that didn't have a lot of measurable data in, and that was a lot of text and a lot of things and a lot of highlights, you know, highlights that are happening at the mine. And I think ESG reporting has evolved and it needs to continue evolve, that it's about highlighting risks and opportunities highlights and also things that need improvement and plans that are put in place, things that, as I said, are measurable. So there, there's a different type of reporting from a major mining company that can provide a significant amount of reporting versus a much more junior mining company. So sort of when I was saying quanti uh, quality over quantity, it really is talking to the junior um, mining companies, the exploration development companies that are trying to get themselves off the ground and get funding. From a pure perspective of Acora, we are listed on the London Stock Exchange as well as the TSX, and we have 13 employees in the company. The amount of ESG reporting we have to do as a royalty and streaming business is substantial compared to the employee size that we have and the task force to do it. And so I am sympathetic to smaller companies that have to produce these reports. And when you are looking to report, it is important that if you can provide more data, you should. Data is good, and as Danielle's demonstrated, it's very, it's incredibly useful um, to generate data points. But it's about value adding, making sure that what you are reporting does add value to investors, and it's not just there to tick a box or to sort of produce a glossy reporting. It's about showing improvements year on year. So mm -hmm. And can I ask a question on uh, the timing of reports? A lot of junior mining companies will produce a. a um, a sustainability report much later than their annual report and that data is not necessarily up to date or, or relevant. I mean, what is your thoughts on producing the two reports um, simultaneously? I think, I mean, integrated reporting is preferable. I mean, you, sustainability, ESG sort of became this buzzword um, and sort of stood on its own a little bit and uh, you know you want as an investor you want to see that sustainability as a core part of the business it's fully integrated into the business and it is coming out of the financials and all through the strategy um, and into the remuneration mm -hmm. and I think integrated reporting allows that to standalone reports is less helpful especially when they come at different times I'm from an investor point of view I'm very pro integrated reporting. Fantastic. Anna? Uh, well, it's again, it's being driven by regulation in the EU, at least. Um, all CSRD disclosures have to be in the main annual filings. But I'd say, you know, integrated reporting, it did sort of, you know, it, it was um, more of a fashionable concept, say, 10 years ago. Um, and it, in some places, didn't really take off, or more generally. I think. Um, the, what's so important is that the sustainability is actually integrated into the strategy, into the business model. You can only have true integrated reporting when it's you've got the policy, strategy, action plans, and reporting all lined up, um, and that's you know looked at alongside um, regular strategic plans. Mm -hmm. I mean, Danielle, it must be sometimes frustrating for you if you get. ESG data quite late in the year. Yeah, absolutely. So we, analysts never want to have to flip between several different reports to gather all of the um, important information. So just from an ease of use perspective, it would be it would be more useful. But I think there's there's also another important point around perception perception from the outside. You know, so I'd be speaking to investors who can who can invest in mining but don't have to who can choose to invest in oil and gas or just anything that isn't extracted, right? So to, to avoid the ESG um, challenges that come with investing in the sector. And I have, up until recently, there is a company that I have in mind that reported their annual report in March and their sustainability report in September, right? And so even from an outside perspective, if you're, if you're a journalist investor thinking, okay, I like, I like the copper story, I might be able to distill who the company is, but I still won't say it. I like the copper story. I want to invest in a, corp, a pure play copper name, but this company doesn't seem to take sustainability seriously if the if the results are six months after um, the financial results, the traditional financial results, right? And so I think that from um, 
sometimes we in the sector can get really insular in terms of you know some of the challenges that might come with integrated reporting um, and having to um, align with different reporting standards and so on but but ultimately I think it's helpful again to zoom out like what perception are you creating by having separate reports um, and I think this, the perception is bad so another tick for integrated reporting um, thanks Danielle we've got about three minutes I think are there any questions in the audience Thank you. Um, Ted Rhodes, uh, CMS, thanks everyone for, for a very interesting discussion. Uh, a question uh, really I think for Alice, um, just in relation to the uh, streaming and, and royalties business, y you said obviously you, you need to do your ESG due diligence when you take your, your, your stream or your royalty, but then you're tied to them for the life of the project or that's the, the intention. Um, I mean, to what extent um, do you find your reputation and, and your risk as the streaming company tied to those companies and, and what levers are you able to pull over the life of the project if, if in fact, you know, they're, they're not delivering on their, their ESG uh, objectives? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so yeah, the, the key point of influence, so to speak, or, or decision making is, is at the point of investment. And after that, it's, you are sort of in that um, partnership for life. And it's very rare that um, royalty and streams would exit from that. Um, it, traditionally, they used to be seen as very much a passive investment, sit there, take the revenue, and don't do anything else. But, you know, the movement of sustainability has improved that relationship quite considerably. Um, I'd say now with all of our portfolio, we have an ongoing dialogue with the operators. So we do a lot of portfolio monitoring and actually monitor the portfolio. We have a tracker, we have issues that we monitor and we engage with the operators. As I was saying, it's, it's more, it's not about seeing reporting, reading it and then sort of carrying on and um, ticking sort of what they're doing. We actually have a dialogue going monthly about issues um, and what they're doing to improve them. If we see anything that's um, publicly released, we can also pick up the phone to them. Um, royalties and streaming contracts as well have evolved. So it's not just about getting data around royalty payments. There's a lot of ESG reporting that's required as part of the quarterly, monthly updates. So there's a lot more... Um, information rights as well as being able to go to site not just to go and see you know what's happening with production but also around sustainability and asking questions around that so the doors are opening and what i think is even interesting even with some of the royalties that are three pages long really old traditional royalties that don't have any levers um, operators are more willing to be transparent with the royalties and streamers and to provide more information and to allow us to come to, to visit site, even though that's not built into the contract. They're going outside of the contract to open the doors. Um, there's, there's, there's always levers if there's a really bad player or a bad reputation. I mean, you could sell the royalty and streaming, but that's not really in our business. Our business is to stay there for the life. So it's about engagement, dialogue, and really collaborative working, um, being transparent and um, explaining what the issues are and how they plan to be managed. There's always going to be risks and issues at mind, but how are they managed, how are they mitigated, and how um, do they improve going forwards? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alice. Unfortunately, we've reached our limit on time, but I'm sure my fellow panellists will be welcome to having conversations offline to anyone. Um, but thanks very much for joining us today.